why the school idol movie has always been weird for me. I feel like there isn't really much to say about the movie because the movie itself doesn't really have anything to say. I don't dislike it at all. There's a lot I enjoy, in fact. I think some of the songs are quite good on their own. And there's a lot of sweet and fun moments with characters I love, even if it ultimately feels like it's just stretching out a story that had long since already reached its natural conclusion. There is always one thing that bothers me about it, though. It's a really terrible musical. You can argue that's because it isn't one, but it basically is. At the very least, it has a lot of the elements of one. Throughout the School Idol Project episodes, only three insert songs, Suzume Tomorrow from the first episode, Koremade no Love Live from the season two premiere, and Happy Maker from the finale, weren't some sort of performance. Every other song was the group performing to some crowd or at some event, or recording a PV or something similar. The movie was Love Live's first big showcase of using insert songs as something beyond in-universe performances, with those only making up three of the movie's six insert songs. However, of these three, only Angelic Angel performed at the end of the first act, with the reception to its in-universe performance being a major plot point in the second, and Sunny Day Song, which is performed at the climax of the film, are integrated into the story proper in any way. The last song, Boku Tashi wa Hitso no Hikari, or We Are a Single Light, as I will proceed to call it for simplicity's sake, is performed over the credits. With the movie showing, it's a video of the group's final performance at the Akiba Dome, a plot point in the movie, being shown to incoming members of the Idol Club by the now third year Yukiho and Alyssa. The other three songs are purely musical numbers with no indication that they occur in universe at all. The characters just burst into song at separate points in what are not canon scenes, but a showcase for the audience, much like in a musical. This is a perfectly fine idea on paper, great even. The fact it took us until like this year to get a full on Love Live musical is still crazy to me. It feels like such a perfect thing for the franchise to do, both because like they're idols, but also tonally. Characters bursting into song about their feelings is the kind of cheese that's right at home in Love Live. Of the three songs that fall into this category, Question Mark Heartbeat is by far the best implemented. After their performance in New York, the girls return home only to see said performances being broadcasted everywhere and people are immediately recognizing them. We then smash cut to them hiding in an alleyway, overwhelmed by the attention they're now getting. After talking about their new predicament, Nozomi says that they need to focus on getting home without getting caught. Q musical numbers where the third years are trying to do just that, while Nico's siblings watch a performance by them on TV. I really love this scene, it's the most underrated insert song in the movie to me, which is a shame because it's so perfectly executed. I feel like it's mostly remembered for Nozo's spin at this point, which is amazing, don't get me wrong, but I think the whole thing is great. The number is only about a minute and a half long, comes less than five minutes after Angelic Angel, which should be the big end of first act showstopper, and is almost smack in the middle of the film, ending right around the 45 minute mark. But it was more memorable to me than pretty much anything else in the movie. The group dealing with now being internationally recognized celebrities is a new situation for them, which makes it exciting and fun to see play out. The song itself perfectly fits that vibe, and its lyrics tells us what the group are feeling, loving the spotlight and being so grateful to all their fans, but also really overwhelmed and right now they just want to get home. Plus, the balance between the exaggerated antics trying to run away and the performance on TV, which is primarily focused on during the segments of the song where they talk about how grateful they are for this opportunity, is really well done. The number communicates what's going on in the story and the characters' minds to the viewer clearly. The whole segment, with the group being overwhelmed by paparazzi and their new fame, is limited almost entirely to just this five or so minute sequence both the build-up to the song and the song itself included, in terms of actual screen time. But it feels way more prominent than it is relative to the overall runtime of the movie because it's communicated and paced so well. Like I said, it's memorable, it sticks with you. On the complete opposite end of the spectrum is Hello Hoshi o Kazate, or Hello Count the Stars. So I had heard this song before actually watching the movie and thought it would be pretty obvious how it was included, 
It'd be while the group was touring New York City, probably in some sort of montage. That's not what happens. After spending the day sightseeing, Rin goes on a spiel about how the city is magical because it's like Juban and also like Muse and full of wonder and opportunity or something. Then everyone goes to leave the roof they were hanging out on, get outside, and are disappointing its rating because that means no more touring. Rin jumps saying it's okay, then suddenly starts a musical number about New York with the first years. After this, they're at a restaurant and the whole thing isn't brought up again, <laughs> making it feel like it just happened for the sake of it. They could have just had them see it's raining, get disappointed, decide to go get food instead, then the next minutes play out like they do in the actual movie, where they decide to go find a Japanese restaurant because Hanayo needs her rice addiction sated, and Honoka gets on the wrong train and ends up meeting totally not her from the future, who also has Sailor Jupiter's voice in the dub. Seriously, it's the same actor doing the same voice, I can't not hear it. <laughs> I like the whole sequence plot-wise. The New York trip in general is the most interesting part of the movie to me by virtue of being a completely new scenario and setting for the characters, but the song before it is so unnecessary because it doesn't add anything. We'd already seen the girls touring and enjoying the city, so it's not like Question Mark Heartbeat where the song progresses the plot or shows you something new or communicates new feelings. Hell, it isn't even like Rin's monologue leads directly into the song, which is like the most basic musical number setup ever. There's a scene cut where they leave the roof and go outside between them, so it's just bizarre. This is also the first song in the whole movie, and it's 20 minutes in. I've seen reviews from the movie that point out clunky implementation of the songs, with the lead-in being things like Rin jumping. And yeah, it's kind of not a great look when this is how your first song and the one that establishes there will be musical elements and non-canon song numbers is handled. Hell, for this stretch of the red time, after they go sightseeing and before their actual performance on Broadway, you'd more naturally expect a song with Honoka or Future Self in the next bit. But that's not what there is. There's nothing like that, in fact. I like the number itself as a standalone MV, and I like the song a lot. But in the context of the movie, it feels like it was added because they chose to have the first years on the Angelic Angel single cover. And since that's the song the group performs in the city, in universe, they needed the first years to have the song about New York. So they just forced this in. The second year song, Future Style, is even more jarring to me. Coming after Honoka says her plan for the final performance and using it to inspire other idols, we get Honoka, Umi, and Kotori singing a song about the future. Umi and Katori weren't part of this planned plot at all. They weren't essential to helping Honoka figure it out. They didn't even really get much input, and we didn't get to see much of them individually struggling with the idea to continue or not, or what to do in the future or anything. They didn't get to do anything in this part of the movie beyond gags, where Umi's overwhelmed by the popularity. Which I liked, don't get me wrong. Them starting the song singing about how the path to the future is now clear is just like... Okay? They're just there because this is the second year's song. The song at least ties in with the idea of deciding the future and finding your path, but it's mainly about facing the future together and like... It would almost make more sense if they had decided they were staying as a group. Or even that the three of them specifically decided they wanted to keep doing music together in some form after the group disbanded, rather than the opposite of this coming when they decide once and for all they're disbanding. If they had been worried about growing apart without Muse, but realized they wouldn't, or vowed to not, and came up with this plan together, the song would be more impactful, but that's not what happens. It's weird and it doesn't fit at all. I always forget it exists as a result, even though on its own I like the song fine enough whenever I actually listen to it. It's not even over a montage of them preparing for the performance or anything basic like that. That also happens after. There's also like a half hour stretch between the three almost back to back numbers at the end of the first act and beginning of the second, and this, which kicks off the third act, which is just weird as hell pacing. 
It doesn't help that this middle portion after Heartbeat is the section of the movie that drags the most because it's just a rehash of season two, episode 11, the one where Muse decides to disband after graduation. With very little new, it almost entirely focuses on Honoka, and since there's no time skip between the end of the show and the movie, it comes off as, do we go back on that major decision we decided on last week? Which, don't get me wrong, relatable as hell, but even the characters acknowledge they weren't really seriously ever going to. If this was all covered in a song, maybe a group number where they ponder the possibility or something and all got to express their mental conflicts that way, it'd at least be new and fast and done in five minutes. But that wouldn't fit how they already wrote and decided to market and structure the songs. I don't have an official source on this, and probably never will, but I have always felt like the creation of Love Live insert songs is somewhat removed from the actual show's writing. I assume they're written as songs for album releases first, and for the show second, typically. This is why they tend to be rather hit or miss in being relevant. Sometimes you get things like Start Dash, Water Blue New World, Solitude Rain, or Go Restart, to name a few examples from each show, where they fit the build-up and themes in their stories perfectly. But then you get others that are just there because there should be a song vaguely tying into an episode's themes or sometimes just for the sake of having a performance. I wouldn't be surprised if the writing staff gives an outline of the stories they're doing and then a song is made or chosen to be put in just based on the vague ideas. So like, say for A New Me and Happy Halloween in School Idol Project Season 2, we got songs to fit Ren gets over her image issues, and Halloween. The former song, Loveling Bell, fits the episode's themes incredibly well. The latter, though, while Dancing Stars on Me is a fun number that I love, it is still just kind of a vaguely Halloween-y sounding song that isn't really about the episode's themes and feels like it could have been replaced by any other vaguely Halloween-y sounding idol song. The movie songs all feel like the result of this style. The writing staff probably outlined the main plot points of New York, the group gets popular from their performance, and they have to decide whether to continue or disband again, and the songs were written outside of the writing staff's hand, meaning it was a crapshoot whether they would actually fit or not. Even Angelic Angel reflects this. Its performance is a big plot point in the film, but the song is, of all possible things, a love song where Ellie's the center. There's some vague lines about enjoying the present, but that's not new for Muse songs, and again, it's mostly a love song. It looks and sounds nice, no doubt why it was used in marketing a lot and is placed as the big end of Act 1 showstopper, but the song itself is so irrelevant to anything the movie's about, it never leaves an actual impression on me while watching the movie. It's just there. I like the visuals a lot. That's it though. The movie stops for three minutes to do a song that doesn't even matter lyrically. It's there for the plot since the performance itself is important to the story, but the actual contents aren't at all. It does its job, but that's it, nothing more. It didn't necessarily need to be something relevant to the plot. Musicals do sometimes have performance songs that are just the characters performing and aren't necessarily important to the narrative lyrically, but it feels odd when the movie only has six songs, and especially combined with the fact that most of the others, again, have the same issue. Sunny Day Song is a bit better. It's a very fitting final number for Muse and does imply the whole inspiring future idols thing in its lyrics. I love that it starts with Muse in the center, far from everyone else, but gradually the crowd of other idols grows closer. It's cute and fits what they were going for. The lyrics don't really reflect the this is our last performance bit enough in my opinion, but that's because it's actually not their last performance. We Are a Single Light, which is performed at the Akiba Dome months later is, and thus actually has the lyrics to back it up. We're just told it happened though. See the performance video, but nothing surrounding it, and the song plays mostly over the credits despite the fact making Love Live happen at the dome was the main plot. So now I must ask, why wasn't this the story? 
Personally, I will always argue Snow Halation is Muse's big climax number, story-wise. The group all come together and write a song from the heart, fight to make it to the venue to perform, with the path only able to be literally cleared for them thanks to the people they've reached on their journey, then on stage with every one of their hearts in sync and a declaration of what they love about their group, they perform, truly make themselves and their goal known to the world, and beat their rivals in the process. The problem is this is during the regionals at the the end of episode 9, and the Love Live finals are actually in episode 12. So there we get Kira Kira Sensation, which is a fine enough song. Then that's followed by the encore the group are called on to perform with this season 1 OP song, which I do like. Ending where we began is a cute way of tying things up. Then, in episode 13, there's the graduation version of Ashiru Banzai, which, again, is also a fitting final number. Maki and Honoka performing the song Honoka initially found Maki playing alone in the music room in the first episode, on stage at a big graduation ceremony as a tribute to their friends, and having the rest of the students join in is a good finale. Again, it's a sweet mark of how far they've come as characters, with Honoka having become a successful idol group leader and a competent student council president, while Maki has gone from hiding away in the music room and not wanting anyone to hear her play, to having friends both to perform with and share her music with, as well as friends she wants to send her love to. Ashuru Banzai does translate to I love you, hooray, after all, and thus also makes a good bookend. But then, in the movie Before Angelic Angel, they say this could be our last performance, even though to anyone watching, it's obviously not going to be. Then a half hour later, we get Sunny Day Song, which is generally considered Muse's finale song. And then, five minutes after that, we get We Are a Single Light, which is their actual final number, both in-universe and in the anime. Not counting Snow Elation, which isn't meant to be a final number, even though, again, I think narratively it is the true climax of the story and I'll die on that hill. That's six final numbers! Even if I'm generous and ignore what they say before Angelic Angel, that's still five! By the time of the credits of the movie, I don't care anymore! They leave no impact on me! I actually didn't watch the movie after my first binge of the show because honestly I was content already and wasn't sure I'd enjoy it. A friend told me it was mainly a rehash. On my second rewatch, in one day and one sitting, I watched everything from Happy Halloween to the movie back to back since I was enjoying rewatching the show so much. And yeah, by the end it felt like the story was long over and the series was just spinning its wheels. When I watch the movie again from now on, I'll probably give it space to watch it on its own rather than immediately following up the show. Before my rewatch, I also forgot the whole we should disband after the third year's graduate is all dealt with in one episode. They even bring up the idea of becoming professional idols and staying together as a group there briefly, even if it isn't a focus as much as in the movie. So it's not even like they're looking at it from a new angle or have a new chance to continue they didn't see before or something. I love episode 11, it's an emotional episode that deals with the conflict perfectly, but that causes there to be no emotional stakes worth going back to for that plotline. If they made the story actually take place a year later and the group is sent to New York to perform as Muse after not having done so for a year to promote Love Live and to try and secure the dome stage, and then they reconsider when they spike in popularity afterward, only to decide to stick to their initial decision and have their final performance be the one at the dome, that would have had more emotional weight. Their choice would matter more because there would have been time away from the present end of the story. They would have had the chance to grow to potentially miss performing together or to question whether they made the right decision. There's new ground and emotions to cover, so it's not just a rehash with nothing new. But can't ever show the characters outside high school, so instead it's all like a week after episode 13. All this would be far less jarring if the musical aspect of the film was good. Then even if we're seeing the same plot again, it would at least feel new. It explored in a new way, give us new insights into the characters' emotions and thoughts that weren't possible in a normal episode, and it'd take advantage of the expanded runtime and actually make re-exploring this plotline feel impactful, because it's doing it in a completely new way. But instead, it's half-hearted, and the movie's music numbers, with the exception of Question Mark Heartbeat, 
the one well done in all aspects musical esque sequence are at best really fun and semi fitting, like Sunny Day Song, and at worst completely irrelevant for the film and just there because they needed to be. Love Live the School My Idol movie is a fun enough ride, with some good moments and fun scenes with characters I love. But it's an ultimately unnecessary extension to a story that had already been finished. It's also a pretty shit musical.